Uh, my name is Johan. I've been at Twig for a couple of months now. Uh, before I started at Twig, I was at Cisco Systems in Norway in the video conferencing business. And before that, I was at Opera making uh, web browsers. But I've, I've meddled with Git and distributed version control since about 2006. Um, at Opera, I, I headed up the migration from CVS to Git, and I was also involved in the migration from Subversion to Git in our Cisco office. Um, a long time ago, I also occasionally contributed some code to Git itself, but I've been mostly involved with administering and teaching Git in my workplace. Uh, this is actually a fairly old talk by now. I first made it when we migrated to Git at Opera back in 2010. Um, but uh, yeah, um, stop me at any time if I'm going too fast or if there is something that doesn't make sense. Um, and this is primarily a starting point. If we, if you've got questions and we start wandering off, that's that's okay too. So the the following story I've shamelessly stolen from Tom Preston Werner, who was one of the founders at GitHub. Uh, he wrote the story, and really the only contribution I've made to this is adapting it to a presentation format. Uh, I did this because I'm lazy, but also because um, this is the best introduction to Git that I've found. So I'm I'm going to try to convince you at least that Git really is a simple and powerful system. Uh, often when people try to teach Git, they demonstrate a few dozen different commands, and then uh, they yell, ta-da, as if that is this uh, how you teach Git. Um, I don't believe that's the be best way to teach Git. Uh, sure, it allows you to, to use Git to perform some simple tasks, but the Git commands themselves still feel like invoking some magic incantation, and doing anything out of the ordinary is often terrifying. Uh, until you understand the basic underlying concepts of Git, you will feel like a stranger in a foreign land. So instead, I will tell you a story. In fact, I'm going to tell you a parable. It's a journey through the creation of a system that looks a lot like Git from the ground up. Um, understanding the concepts is the most valuable thing I find to fully understand how Git works. The concepts themselves are very simple, but they allow for a lot of amazing functionality. And after learning about this parable, you should have everything you need to easily master the various Git commands. Sure, you will have to look up some documentations and stuff, but you will at least know how they operate on the underlying structure. And this is basically what you need to become a Git power user. So let's start. Imagine that you have a simple computer with absolutely nothing on it, but a text editor and some uh, simple file system commands. And you've decided to write a large software program on the system. But you're a responsible software developer, so you want to keep track of your versions so that you can retrieve code that you've previously changed or deleted. And what follows here is a story about how you might design this version control system and the reasoning behind those design choices. But before we start the software project, you have a friend called Alfred. He is a photographer, and he uh, works all day long taking awkward family photos. Alfred tells you a story about a woman named Hazel who brings her daughter in for a portrait every year on the same day. She likes to remember what her daughter was like at each different stage, as if the snapshots really let her move back and forth in time to those saved memories. You suddenly see the ideal solution to your version control dilemma. What you want are snapshots. They're, these are like save points in a video game, and it's what you, uh, what you care about in your version control system. What if you could take snapshots of your code base at any time and then resurrect that code on demand? And you go back to your computer and you start working. You start your project in a directory that we're calling working, and you try to write one feature at a time. When you complete a self-contained portion of a feature, then you duplicate the entire working directory to archive that current state. But you're going to make more copies of these working directories, so you rename the copy to snapshot.0. And the most important rule here is that after you have copied the code into snapshot.0, you never again change the code inside snapshot.0. After the next chunk of work, you make another copy, so you make snapshot.1, and so on. But to remember the changes that you made in each snapshot, you add a special file that you call message to each snapshot directory. This file contains a summary of the work that you did and the date that you did it. If you want to find a specific change that you made in the past, you search through the message files in the previous snapshots. 
after some time, you get ready to, to uh, uh, make a release candidate. So you decide to release your snapshot.99 as your version 1.0. So you package it up and you distribute it and your users love it and you push forward determined to make the next version an even bigger success. You keep adding new features. Say you make 10 new snapshots. Your version control system at this point is your faithful companion. The old versions are there when you need them and you can access them with ease. But not long after the release, you start getting bug reports from version 1.0. In order to fix the bugs in version 1.0, you copy your snapshot.99, the, the snapshot folder that corresponds to your version 1.0. You copy that into your working directory so that your working directory is exactly at the point where you release your version 1.0. And you can then make the required fixes to that version. But at this point, a problem becomes apparent. The version control system deals very well with linear development. But now, for the first time, you need to create a new snapshot that is not a direct descendant of the preceding snapshot. Your snapshot 110 does not follow directly from snapshot 109. It follows from snapshot 99. This breaks the linear flow. And you can no longer determine the ancestry of any given snapshot just by counting backwards. So clearly, you need something more powerful than a linear system. But you've been wor working hard. It's time to have a break, and you take a walk outside. Outside, you walk past an oak tree, and you start looking more closely at it. You start looking at the branch tip, and you trace it back to the trunk of the tree. The tree is a very complex structure in, in full, but the rules for finding your way back to the trunk are so simple, and they're perfect for keeping track of multiple lines of development. You have another epiphany. By looking at your code history as a tree, solving the problem of ancestry now becomes trivial. You need each snapshot to point to the previous snapshot, also known as the parent snapshot. So each snapshot has one parent, except for the very first snapshot. Now, how do you store this pointer to the previous snapshot? Well, you can include the name of the parent snapshot in this message file that you write for each snapshot. That pointer enables you to easily and accurately trace the history of any given snapshot all the way back to the root. So now your code history is a tree. Instead of having a single latest snapshot, you have two latest snapshots now. You have one for each branch. This basically starts your nonlinear history. And your sequential numbering system is less useful. You cannot easily determine the latest snapshot because you have multiple latest snapshots, one for each branch. However, creating these new development branches has become so simple that you'll want to take advantage of it all the time. You'll be creating branches for fixes to old releases. You can create branches for experiments that may not even pan out. Indeed, it becomes possible to create a new branch for every new feature that you begin. But like everything good in life, there's a price to be paid. You need some way to keep track of all these branches and which snapshots belong on which branch. So every time that you create a new branch, you probably give it some, some description or a name in your head. Um, so here we have snapshot 109, that's your sort of master branch. And then we have snapshot 110, which basically becomes your version 1.0 maintenance branch. Now, to find the snapshots on a branch, you only need to remember the latest snapshot on that branch. The early snapshots, you can always find them by just tracing the parent pointer from, from each snapshot back, back through your history. So how do we store the link between branches and their latest snapshots? Well, it's, it's simple. We can create another text file called branches. We store this outside of any specific snapshot because it's outside of, of the history of, of the code. And in that file, you simply list the name and snapshot pairs that represent the tips of your branches. So now, if you want to switch to a given branch, you look up the snapshot for that branch in this file, and then you copy that snapshot directory into your working directory. Because you're only storing the latest snapshots on each branch, creating a new snapshot now contains an additional step. If the new snapshot is being created as part of a branch, well, then you need to update the branches file so that the name of the branch becomes associated with a new snapshot. But in all, it's a, a small price to pay for the benefit. After using branches for a while, you also notice that you need a different kind of reference. You want a reference that always points to a certain snapshot and never moves. 
you want to use these special references for labeling certain important snapshots, like your version 1.0 or your version 101 when you fix that bug. Since these don't behave like regular branches, you decide to call them tags instead, and you store them in a separate file so that you don't accidentally treat them as a regular branch. Now, working on your own gets pretty lonely. Wouldn't it be nice if you could invite a friend to work on your project with you? Well, you're lucky. Your friend Zoe has a computer setup just like yours, and she wants to help with the project. Because you created such a great version control system, you tell her all about it, and you send her a copy of all your snapshots, branches, and tags so that she can enjoy the same benefits of the code history. It's uh, great to have Zoe on the team, but she has a habit of taking long trips to faraway places without internet access. As soon as she has the source code, she catches a flight to Patagonia, and you don't hear from her for a week. In the meantime, you both do a lot of coding. When she finally gets back, you discover a critical flaw in your version control system. Because you've both been using the same numbering system, you each have directories called snapshot 114 and snapshot 115 and so on, but they have different contents. And to make matters worse, you don't even know who authored the changes in those new snapshots. So together, you devise a plan for dealing with these problems. First, you change the snapshot messages to contain the author name and email. This is just makes it easier to, to keep track of who made each change. Second, we should not actually name the snapshots with simple numbers. Instead, we can use the contents of the message file and the SHA-1 algorithm to produce a hash. This hash will be unique to the snapshot since no two messages will ever have the same date, message, parent, and author. You both update your histories with a new technique and instead of clashing snapshots 114 folders, you now have distinct folders named 8BA344 and DB9ECB something. And you do this process for all the other snapshots as well. With this updated naming scheme, it now becomes trivial for you to fetch all the new snapshots from Zoe's computer and place them next to your existing snapshots. Because every snapshot specifies its parent and identical messages, and therefore identical snapshots, have identical names, no matter where they are created, the history of the code base can still be drawn as a tree. Only now, the tree is comprised of snapshots authored by both Zoe and you. This point is important, so I'll repeat it. A snapshot is defined by the SHA-1 sum or the message file that uniquely identifies it and its parent. These snapshots can be created and moved around between computers without losing their identity or where they, where they belong in the history tree of a project. And finally, snapshots can be shared or kept private as you see fit. If you have some experimental snapshots that you want to keep to yourself, you can do so quite easily. You just don't make them available to Zoe. Now, Zoe's travel habits cause her to spend countless hours on planes, airplanes and, air bo and, and boats. Most of the places she visits have no readily available internet access. At the end of the day, she spends more time offline than online. It is no surprise then that Zoe raves about your version control system. All of the day-to-day -day operations that she needs to do, she can do those locally. The only time she actually needs a network connection is when she is ready to share her snapshots with you. And now let's simplify our drawings a little bit here so that we can focus on the more important things. We don't need to draw the working directory and the branches and text files. We know that they're always there anyway. Instead, we will add labels that point to the branches and tags that we're currently interested in. Branches in green and tags in yellow. There's a master branch. There's a version 1.0 uh, maintenance branch. There's a moth branch that we'll use shortly. And finally, there are two tags, version 1.0 and 101. And finally, let's draw the snapshots as simple dots. But remember that there are still the same snapshot directories that we created from the start. And since the pointers between snapshots always point downwards in this graph, we can use some simple lines instead. Now, before Zoe left on her trip, you had asked her to start working off of the branch named Moth and to implement a function that generated irrational numbers. So she made these three green uh, snapshots on the right hand side. Meanwhile, you were also developing off of the moth branch, only you were writing a function to generate, say, unreal numbers. So you made the two blue snapshots. Now that Zoe has returned, you're faced with the task of merging these two separate branches of development into a single snapshot. But how? 
So in your working directory, you can copy in the changes that were done on both branches, and you can reconcile their differences. And you can then create a new snapshot, a merged snapshot from the working directory. But there is something special about this snapshot. Instead of just a single parent, this merged snapshot has two parents. The first parent is the latest on your math branch, and the second is uh, the second parent is Zoe's latest on her math branch. And once you complete the merge, Zoe can fetch all the snapshots that you have that she doesn't have yet. And that includes your development on the math branch, the two blue commits, and the merge snapshot. Once she has done this, both of your histories match exactly again, and you're back in sync. Now, like many software developers, you have a compulsion to keep your code clean and very well organized. This carries over into a desire to keep your code history well-groomed as well. But last night, you came home after having a few too many pints of Guinness at the local pub, and you started coding. You produced a handful of snapshots along the way. And this morning, when you uh, review the code you wrote last night, it makes you cringe a little bit. The code is actually good overall, but you made a lot of mistakes early on that you corrected in later snapshots. Now, let's say that the branch on which you did your drunken development is called drunk, and you made three snapshots after you got home from the bar. If the name drunk points to the latest snapshot on that branch, we can invent some useful notation to refer to the parent of that snapshot. Let's use the notation drunk hat, using the, the hat or carrot character, to mean the parent of the snapshot pointed to, the, uh, pointed to by the branch named drunk. And similarly, drunk hat hat then means the grandparent of the drunk snapshot. So the three snapshots that you made last night in chronological order are drunk hat hat, then drunk hat, and then finally drunk. Now, let's say that the end result from these three messy snapshots of the drunk branch consists of changing an existing function foo and adding a new file bar.cpp. You'd really like those three lousy snapshots to be two cleaner snapshots, one that changes the ex uh, existing function foo and another one that adds a new file bar.cpp. To accomplish this revision of history, you can copy your drunk uh, snapshot into your working directory and you can delete the fi new file bar.cpp. So now your working directory contains the first change only, the correct modifications to the existing function foo. You can then create a new snapshot from working and you can write the message to be appropriate for those changes. And for the parent for this new snapshot, you can choose, uh, you can specify the SHA-1 of the drunk hat 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 snapshot, basically creating, oh, sorry, basically creating a new uh, branch off of the same starting point that you chose last night. Now, you can again copy the drunk snapshot into your working directory and you can roll a new snapshot. And this will now simply add the new file bar.cpp because the changes in the function foo were already in the previous snapshot. So as the parent, you specify the snapshot you just created. And as the last step, you can now move the branch name drunk to point to the last snapshot that you just made. The history of the drunk branch now represents a nicer version of what you did last night. The other snapshots that you've replaced, they are no longer needed, so you can delete them or you can just leave them around for posterity. Uh, no branch names are currently pointing at them, so it will be hard to find them later on, but if you don't delete them, they'll stick around. As much as you try to keep your new modifications related to a single feature or logical chunk, you sometimes get sidetracked and you start hacking on something totally unrelated. Only halfway into this, you suddenly realize that your working directory now contains what really should be two separate snapshots. To help you with this annoying situation, the concept of a staging directory is useful. This area acts as an intermediate step between your working directory and a final snapshot. So each time you finish a snapshot, you first copy it into the staging directory, and then you can create the snapshot from that staging directory. If a change belongs in the next snapshot, then you mimic the change inside staging. But if it doesn't, you can leave it inside your working directory and make it part of some later snapshot. When you're satisfied with the stage of the staging directory, you create a new snapshot from there. This separation of coding and preparing the stage makes it easy to specify what is and what is not included in the next snapshot. 
you no longer have to worry too much about making an accidental or unrelated change in your working directory. You have to be a bit careful though. Consider you have a file called readme and you make an edit to this file and you then mimic that in staging. You go on about your business, you edit some other files, but after a while you make another change to readme. Now you have made two changes to that file, but only the first one is in the staging area. If you were to create a snapshot now, your second change would be absent. So the lesson is, is fairly simple. Every new edit must be added to the staging area if it is to be part of the next snapshot. Now, with a working directory, a staging area, and loads of snapshots lying around, it starts to get confusing as to what the specific code changes are between these directories. A snapshot, uh, a snapshot message only gives you a summary of what changed, but it doesn't really tell you exactly what lines were changed between two files. Using a diffing algorithm, you can make a small program that shows you the differences in two code bases. As you develop and copy things from your working directory to the staging area, you will want to easily see what is different between the two so that you can determine what else needs to be staged. It's also important to see how the staging area is different from the last snapshot, since these changes are what will become part of the next snapshot that you produce. There are many other diffs that you might want to see as well. The difference between a specific snapshot and its parent would show you the specific changes that were introduced by that sna snapshot. The diff between two branches would be helpful to make sure that your development doesn't wander too far away from the main line, for example. Now, remember Zoe? After a few more trips around the world, Zoe starts to complain that her hard drive is filling up with hundreds of nearly identical copies of the software. You too have been feeling like all the file duplication is wasteful. After a bit of thinking, you come up with something very clever. You remember that the SHA-1 hash produces a short string that is unique for a given file contents. Now, starting with the very first snapshot in the project history, you start a big conversion process. First, you create a directory named objects that lives outside of the code history. Next, you go into the first snapshot directory and you find the most deeply nested directory inside that snapshot. Additionally, you open up a temporary file for writing. Now, for each file in the most deeply nested directory, you perform the following three steps. Step one, you calculate the SHA-1 of the file contents. Step two, you add an entry into the temp file that contains the word blob, followed by the SHA-1 from the first step, and then the file name. And step three, you copy the file into the objects directory, but you also rename it to, to have the, uh, using the SHA-1 from, from step one. So you repeat this process for the other two files in that directory. You take file two, pull it through the SHA-1 algorithm, you add an entry to the temporary file, that uh, associates the file2 name with its SHA-1, and then you move file2 into the object directory, renaming it with the SHA-1. Same thing for file3. Once you've finished with all the files, you can now take the temp file. You can pull that through SHA-1 to find its, its, uh, its uh, hash, um, and then you can move that into the object directory as well, uh, renaming it with the SHA-1. Note that the contents of this temporary file exactly mirrors the contents of your sub sub there one. It's kind of a directory listing. And we use this fact in the next phase. So now we move up one directory and we start over. Only this time, when you get to the entry for the directory that you just processed, you enter the word tree instead of blob. You enter the SHA-1 of the temp file from the last time, and you enter the directory's name into the new temp file. So to identify the contents of the sub sub there one directory, we re reuse the SHA-1 of the directory listing from the last phase. And at this level, there's also a regular file, file four. We handle this in the same way as the previous files in sub sub there one. We calculate the SHA-1, we add an entry to the temp file, and we move it into the object directory using the SHA-1 as its name. When we finish that directory level, we hash and store the directory listing, and we keep going at the next level. And in this fashion, you can build up a tree of directory object files that contain the SHA-1s and the names of the files and directory objects that they contain. Once this has been accomplished for every directory and file inside this first snapshot, you will have the SHA-1 of the directory listing for the root folder of your snapshot. 
Now, you need to record that root tree SHA-1 somewhere. But where would you record it? Well, an ideal place to store it is in the snapshot message file. This way, the contents of the message now also depends on the entire contents of the snapshot. And you can guarantee that two identical snapshot messages must contain exactly the same files as well. It is also very convenient to create an object from the snapshot message in the same way that you do for these blobs and trees. Since you're maintaining a list of branch and tag names that point to your message shot once, you, uh, you don't have to worry about losing track of which snapshots are important to you. So with all this information stored inside the objects directory, you can now safely delete the first snapshots directory that you used as the source for, for this entire operation. If you want to recreate that snapshot at a later date, it's simply a matter of following the SHA-1 of the root tree stored in the message file and extracting the tree and blobs into the corresponding directories and files. For a single snapshot, this transformation process doesn't really get you much. You've really only converted one directory structure into another kind of directory structure, and you've created a lot of extra work in the process. But once you start transforming the second snapshot, you discover something. Many of the files and directories are unchanged from the first snapshot, and they therefore end up with the same SHA-1. But since they have the same SHA-1, they already exist inside the objects directory, and you don't have to copy them in there. Imagine you have two sequential snapshots. Both have, say, 10 directories and 100 files in total. But the change from one to the other touches only a, fi a single file in the top directory. This transformation process will create 10 trees and 100 blobs for the first snapshot, but only one new blob and one new tree from the second snapshot. Everything else is already in the objects directory. As you can see, the real benefits of this system arise from reuse of trees and blobs across snapshots. By converting every snapshot directory in the old system to object files in the new system, you can drastically reduce the number of files that are stored on disk. And now, instead of storing perhaps 50 identical copies of a rarely changed file, you only need to keep one. Eliminating this blob and tree duplication significantly reduces the total storage size of your project history. But that's not the only thing you can do to save space. Source code is mostly just text, and text can be very efficiently compressed using common compression algorithms. So if you compress every blob before computing its SHA-1 and saving it to disk, you can further reduce the total storage size of the project history by a significant amount. Ta-da! The version control system that you have constructed by now is a reasonable approximation of what Git actually is. The main difference is that gives, uh, Git gives you command line tools to handle all these things as creating new snapshots and switching to old ones. Um, obviously, Git uses the term commit instead of snapshots. Uh, Git gives you commands for tracing through the history. It keeps the branch tips up to date automatically. Uh, Git has tools to fetch changes from other people to merging and diffing uh, and hundreds of other common and not so common tasks. Um, but really, to get started, um, I'm going to show you a few commands here, but, but not a lot. Um, First, there are a couple of commands to make sure that your snapshots get the correct author information. You only need to run this once per machine that you work on. Um, you can always get help on specific commands in Git. There's a dash H option that gives you, uh, typically gives you short help for, for that option. And then there's Git help for a command that uh, shows you the manual page. And that gives you the full reference documentation, which is very useful, but sometimes uh, also a bit confusing because there's a lot of documentation there. Um, to start a new repository in, inside the current directory, you run git init. Uh, the current directory will be your working directory, and the objects and staging area, branches, tags, and other stuff will live inside the .git subdirectory. To move changes from your working directory into the staging area, you use git add. And to make a new snapshot from the staging area, you use git commit. If you use git commit-a, you will make a new commit directly from all the changed files in the working directory. Git log gives you a list of all the commits on the current branch. And Git K is a nice uh, GUI version of this. Uh, it draws a nice graph of the relationship between the commits as well. And finally, Git status gives you a summary of the current stages, staged and unchanged, uh, unstaged changes. Now, to see the differences between the working directory and the staging area, 
you can use gitif. And if you want to see the changes that are scheduled to become part of the next commit, gitif that are staged, we'll, we'll show you those. Git diff against head will show you the diff between the working directory and the latest commit, which in, in git is always called head. Finally, you can use git diff and then pass two commits to see the difference between any two commits in the repository. Git branch will show you a list of your current branches and you can create new branches um, with it as well. You can also use git checkout, uh, checkout to switch to that branch and git checkout dash B is a handy shortcut when you want to start a new branch and switch to it. Uh, similarly for tags, git tag dash L lists the existing tags and you can also use git tag to create a new tag. To start talking to a different Git repository on, on someone else's machine, you use git remote add. This gives you a short name to be used to refer to that other repository. And in Git lingo, this is called a remote. You can then use git fetch with that name to fetch the branches from that remote. These branches are now available in your repository under that remote name um, namespace. So name slash branch. And you can git log or you can git diff against these branches to see how they differ from, from your branches. To merge one of these branches into the current branch, you use git merge. And git pull is really only a shorthand for those two commands. It first, first merges, it first fetches changes from a different repository and then merges them into your current branch. Um, and, and I typically uh, advise people to use git fetch if you're not ready to merge yet. Because with git fetch, you can fetch changes and you can look at them, but nothing changes in your working directory. And then when you're ready to merge, you can then either do a git pull or a git merge. Mm -hmm. As you continue to learn git, keep this parable in mind. Git is really very simple underneath the covers. And it's this simplicity uh, that makes it so flexible and so powerful. One last thing before you run off to learn all the Git commands. Uh, remember that it's almost impossible to lose work that has been committed. Even when you delete a branch, all that's really happened is that the pointer to that commit has been removed. All of the snapshots are still inside the objects directory. You'll not just need to dig up the commit SHA-1. In these cases, look up Git reflog. Um, as Matthew talked about in a previous knowledge sharing session, it's, it's really useful to see where your repository was at at some previous point in time. It contains a history of what each branch pointed to, and in times of crisis, it will really save the day. But first, commit, because anything that is committed will not be lost by Git, at least not within 90 days. Um, there are some lots of good resources on, on learning Git online. Here are some of the best ones that I found. Um, I, I really like to, to push this Oh My Git game. It's basically a, a nice game that teaches you Git concepts in a, in a fun way. And I find that uh, a lot of Git understanding is built when you can visualize how the various Git commands manipulate the, the history graph. And this game is really good at teaching that. Otherwise, there are links to the Git homepage. There's a pro Git book, which is really good. Uh, GitHub is well known by everybody by now, uh, and there are a couple of other resources here as well. So yeah, that's pretty much the talk, and I think we can just leave the rest uh, rest of the time for the questions if there are any. Yeah, so I've used Git reflog a few times, but um, I guess I've never actually learned what's it actually tracking. Is it like head, or is it is it like per branch? Um, uh, both actually. If you just type git reflog enter, it will show you where your head pointed at previous points in time. So when you switch from uh, a branch uh, foo to a branch bar, that will be reflected in the git reflog for head because head moved from foo to bar. But you can also do git reflog on a specific branch and it will then show you where that branch pointed in previous uh, in, in, in your post. So both that's actually. Good. That's good to know. Yeah, I've only used it in the first form. So. Yeah. yeah, nice. And obviously I, I expect this talk to be old news to a lot of people here at Twig. Um, 
And uh, basically what Matthew talked about a couple of weeks ago is sort of almost a continuation of this talk, I find, because uh, once you start using it, um, Matthew's talk is, is very good at, at uh, teaching you how to get out of a pickle. So look up that talk if you haven't watched it yet. Uh, any other questions? Well, if not, then I think we can hold thank you on and stop here for now. Thanks.